Coming up on Theater Talk. Now, Susan, I, I don't quote myself that much like Kanye West does, but there is one quote of mine that I'd like to share, and it it's, has to do with what we're talking about. If you don't see yourself represented, go out and represent yourself. And that's what, that's what we do. So without further ado, let's bring it the legend. Let's bring him to the stage, Michael Musto. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Musto. Michael Musto, you brought some friends with you today to our Halloween gala party. I did. We have Daniel Nordicchio, who's the co-owner of Club Coming, the hot new East Village, co-owned also by Alan Cumming. I have Bridget Everett, the fabulous cabaret singer and the co-star of the movie Patty Cakes. And Bridget's pilot is going to be on Amazon November 10th. It's called Love Me More. Love you more, but yeah. Love you more. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, Mr. Showbiz himself, Murray Hill, who's going to be at Joe's Pub in December. Showbiz. And Murray, welcome back to Theater Talk. Oh, I know my career before? has skyrocketed yeah. since I've been on here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I love Club Coming, not only because I perform there, Susan, but it is a kind of Weimar-esque place that emphasizes performance. It puts the spotlight back on edgy, quirky, offbeat entertainment. Okay, so Have now why? what I want to know from all of you is why edgy, quirky, offbeat entertainment? What has drawn you into that world? Of all the things in theater that you could have chosen to do, Bridget, why are you doing edgy, quirky, quite sometimes explicit, offbeat entertainment? Um, because I, I like to... Uh, I like cabaret as a contact sport, like a full contact sport and like uh, getting to know people in the audience. And I feel like the downtown <laughs> world really knows so. how to get to know an audience <laughs> unlike any other uh, performance, uh, what's it ca called, a different, what's it called, kind of performance style. <laughs> yeah. You hitting on me on TV? Now, <laughs> when you were a young Bridget Everett, yeah. did you think, <laughs> I want to be before you like, were Grandma Mosey. Yeah, really. <laughs> when you were young? Oh no, I mean, in, I mean, in, in 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 junior high school. Yeah. Now, did you say? She didn't go to school. <laughs> I'm gonna be I'm gonna be Julie Andrews, or did you say no? I Let me tell phone. you, I love Julie Andrews, and we happen to have the yes. same agent. I remember the day that she lost her voice, like people remember the day Kennedy was shot. It was you know, it was yeah. very traumatic it was for really me. A, a traumatic um, and I love her. I adore her, but I also loved like John Belushi and Carol Burnett and, and Freddie Mercury. And Andy Kaufman. Um, and Barry Manilow. I always wanted to go to New York and I always wanted to be a singer, but um, but not like a Broadway star. That's that's Patti LuPone's world and that, and I love Patti LuPone. But, but let her have it. But let her have it. Yeah. But when but I met Murray, people like Murray Hill, I was like, yeah. this this is it. This is what I want to be doing. Well, you two I had at all my parties. I never paid you, but <laughs> you always lit up my parties. And, and I was you, never invited. You uh, gave us drink tickets. You crashed. And you both went to rehab. Now, Murray, <laughs> you, you, when I first became aware of you, you, you were- You sound like my therapist. Yeah. <laughs> Not were, when we met, when I became aware of no, you. No, no, but you were, uh, you were called a drag king. It, it, are, are you that anymore? Um, I'm just an it. Okay. Now, I think that's the least offensive, <laughs> least offensive uh, identification now. But the world has changed. The world has changed. You I'm were, just Murray. You I'm just Murray. I'm just Murray. There just Murray. Like, yeah, yeah. I do a little litmus test during the show. All right. I say, okay, this guy here. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I'm reading your mind. I'm thinking, <laughs> is he? Is he? He's thinking, is it a man or a woman? Is it a man or a woman? And I say, sir, the answer is no. And then I said, <laughs> if you don't get that show, it's to be the longest two hours of your life. <laughs> Now, Club Coming was a hit right out of the box, and the first yes. week, guess who took the stage? Paul McCartney and yeah. Emma Stone got on stage at Club Coming and sang Part of Your World from Little Mermaid. And then Paul did the harmonica song with the world's smallest harmonica. So was, how did you get the word out to have Paul McCartney? Well, I was the Emma fifth Stone. Beatle. A lot of people don't know that. And so, um, <laughs> no, I, uh, you know, Emma's and it was in a movie with Alan and also in Cabaret with Alan. So she just said, I'm with Billie Jean King at Paul McCartney's concert, and we're thinking about coming to Club Coming. <laughs> and when you get that text, you're like, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's move some tape. So she, all of a sudden they just walked in and it was like mayhem. We had Jack Aronson, the piano player, was playing on the keys. People were singing and all of a sudden it went crazy and they went up and sang. And so speaking of duets, 
Now you're building a show around Michael Musto and I had well yes. Daniel recognized my incredible immense performing talent and booked a duets night which we already did which was a benefit for Sage. We're now doing another one on November 11th at 9 p.m. a benefit for Gays Against Guns. Yeah. Murray and Bridget have both crazily agreed to participate. <laughs> it's quite a we have too. to. Have you been to Club Coming Up? We went together. Yes, uh, we did. Yeah, when it was opening. Yeah. What'd we you saw, think? We, uh, we saw some. It was shock and awe. It was really great. Yeah, nice. It was like old uh, New York. You know, it felt like yeah. the New York when I first moved oh. here. It was really fun. Now, are you getting an eclectic audience or is this a very special? Very much so. These villages are very like college students. So we're getting some college students and we're getting some Hell's Kitchen queens that are coming over. What I like is... And it's your dating given, pool. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, the, what I like is that there's also a mixture. You know, we end up getting little people coming. We had a bunch of little people come in the other night. <laughs> but you charge um, them full price. That's right. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. We'll pay, we actually charge by the pound. So, oh. um, oh, well, Bridget so, and I can't afford to go there. Though. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, uh, you know, because radio is <laughs> coming and swing, big swing. So a bunch of those people came down and from the show and. Every night it's something different. Your best friend Countess Luann came last night. Now who Wonderful. is Countess Luann? She's from the Real Housewives of New York. She's the most famous fake countess in it's New York. It's been on 20 seasons, Susan. And we get never, them. I've never seen it. Club coming. It's sort of like the Cafe Carlisle meets CBGB's. Oh, it is? It is. Yeah. All right, well, I knew CBGB's. I, I mean, I, I like for my event, it's not cheap to get in. It's yeah. avant-garde, and yet Does it's Does that mean accessible. we're getting paid? Yeah. I told you you're getting 50 bucks. <laughs> an honorarium. Well, you didn't tell you. me. I didn't find out She's I was getting. She's getting 50 bucks. <laughs> Uh oh! I have two personalities. I need a hundred. Uh -uh. <laughs> I gave you a drink ticket ten years ago. Now, what, what are you going to do on stage with Michael Musto in his gala show on November 11th? I'm personally going to clear the room because <laughs> they put me on last with Michael. So when they want everyone to leave, they're all right, let's get Murray up. No. Murray no. and Michael will sing. The whole place will clear up. We're doing up. a raunchy version of "Lady Is a Tramp," and with Bridget, I'm doing "Don't Rain in My Parade" by Barbara Streisand. Because <laughs> in my mind, Barbara wrote it. What? what? <laughs> yeah. by, Bar oh, by Julie Stein. <laughs> oh, whatever. Yeah. All right. So what are you going to sing with him? Lady is a tramp. Oh, you said that lady is a tramp. Well, I didn't. He did. But right, you're, I'm, I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> but neither one of us is a lady. No, I'm, I'm, I'm producing and directing at the same time. Now, all right. What? Oh, my director. <laughs> I'm sorry, Catalan. I'm not directing. Now, <laughs> I want, you, to, I want you to tell our audience what you're going to do on Halloween. For you first. We're doing a party at Club Coming, which yes. is Halloween spectacular. Alan's going to be there. And some of a lot of people will be in costume. And it's one of the greatest nights I find for celebrities. They can go out and do anything. Yes. Because they just wear a mask and they can run around. So we're getting, it's not just celebrities. I'm not saying Club Coming is just that, but it's like we're doing this big Halloween party. Now, Murray, I'm going to get psychologically incisive with you. Why Murray Hill? <laughs> Ooh. What, for Halloween? No, ever, all the time. Why Murray Hill? Why do you live there? Why do you live there? No, why do you live in Murray Hill? No, no, I don't right. live there. First of all, it's before 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Everybody take it easy. But Murray Hill, <laughs> I, you were born in the back of a taxi, but I also heard that you went to the School of Visual Arts and had a, a very different life. All right, listen, Susan, just right. take it easy. She's done her research. <laughs> yeah, she's done her research. One line, very good. You opened up Wikipedia. Now, now listen, oh. Susan, Susan, this is a better life. You know, you asked before why we do cabaret and downtown and all that stuff. No one else <laughs> took us in. So it's much better to live this life than the other life where you get you get it all the time, you get made fun of, you get this and that. This we don't life, want you in this life either. Yeah, they don't want me in this life. So now I just wear a custom made suit for my grandmother's couch, and nobody bothers me, and it's, and I make people laugh. It's all much better. How's that for an answer? Who do you, well, well, who do you make laugh? <laughs> what about you, Bridget? What about me? Yeah, is it a better life? This? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm wearing the, the low-cut dresses that I saw at Club 54 or Studio 54 back in the day when I was growing up, and I get to sing whatever I want, you, do whatever I want, say whatever I want. You killed on Jimmy Fallon. Oh, yes. thank you. And, and, I, yeah. and we get um, to be on Theater Talk. And we get to be on Theater Talk. We go from The Tonight Show to Theater Talk. It's, it's a logical <laughs> rise in the, in the show business. Food Next chain. step, Robin Bird. <laughs> oh, I, wish, I wish she's still on, she's, but she doesn't have a show anymore, does no, she? No, she still really? plays it, though. I think What's, as if it's new. So would you say it wasn't a choice, your career trajectory, it kind of chose you in a way? I, I honestly feel yeah. like when I saw Murray and Kiki and Herb and I moved to New York and I saw all these people, it, it finally made sense to me. I was like, this is the life. This is I the agree. world I want to be a part of. And, and, you know, getting to be on Theater Talk with Michael Musto, I remember when I, I was writing something when I first moved to New York about how cool it was and I thought, you know, Michael was like... That was like if you could if you could get in with Michael, like if he knew who you were and gave you like his his uh, seal of approval that you knew you'd made it. So yeah, it's I look and twenty Justin. years later, he'll make you sing a song. <laughs> Yeah, for $50. But to be a part of that world. <laughs> it's like, a benefit. Like, no, no, you know, like, 
Well, I remember Sandy and everybody all yeah. you know our our, our friend um, the drag queen like just people who were just like no boundaries and and lawless and like and all of a sudden you're like wait I can do that and and ma well maybe not make a living it takes a while but you know like thirty years later <laughs> yeah, but we're doing it now and Murray and I tour together and when we go out and and we're playing to these like mainstream audiences people are so hungry for something that's different and original. Now, Susan, I, I don't quote myself that much like Kanye West does and DJ Khaled and all these wonderful people, but there is one quote of mine that I like to share, and it's it has to do with what we're talking about. If you don't see yourself represented, go out and represent yourself. And that's what that's what we do. But I get to do theater talk with my guest co-host Michael Musto. How I fantastic! I love doing theater talk with you, that? and I can't All wait right. for Halloween at Club Coming and November 11th, my duets de night at Club Coming. That's and it. We're done. This is it. We th any any more any more thoughts? I got up this early and I get two lines in. You get to do one more. Got <laughs> Showbiz. Show love biz. you, Susan. Love theater talk. Great show. Yes, I love you all. Honored to be here. We're, we're yeah, very this is honored really to awesome. Thank you, Daniel Nardiccio, Murray Hill, Bridget Shows. Everett, and Susan Haskins. It's been a delight to co-host this with you. Thank you, Michael Musto. Thank you, viewers. Show biz. Both of you. Don't tell me not to live just in putter. Life's candy and the sun's a ball of butter. Don't worry about the clouds are rain in my parade. Don't tell me not to fly. I've simply got you. If someone takes a spill, it's me and not you. Who told you you're allowed? Happy Halloween. I am Susan Haskins. And I'm Jason Zinneman. Jason is my guest co-host for the week from the New York Times and very topically for Halloween, he is the author of Shock Value, How a Few Eccentric Outsiders Gave Us Nightmares, Conquered Hollywood, and Invented Modern Horror. Please introduce our guest, Jason. Thank you. Well, we're lucky around Halloween to have two theatrical masters of horror with us, two people who have been scaring audiences around Halloween for many years, Tim Haskell, who is a... Uh, producer impresario of haunted houses and shows of many years and this year of a show called This Is Real and a uh, playwright, screenwriter, performer and uh, most importantly the uh, creator of Pumpkin Pie Show which has its 20th anniversary year also around Halloween. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Um, so we want to talk about what is scary in theater and my first question is um, when it comes to sort of scaring people out of their wits, uh, what can theater do that other forms cannot? Or what can theater do better than any other form? <laughs> well, I think you've got a living, breathing performer in front of a living, breathing audience member. And that, that in itself, just the, the intimacy alone, I think for my money, makes it yeah. you know, tenfold uh, more, more valuable than what film and literature can do. I, you, just being able to see the kind of white of your audience's eyes and kind of tuck that fourth wall behind the audience member, I think, I think just making it feel like this is, this is, this is it, you know, we're, we're in this yeah, together. I mean, there's an element of danger that um, doesn't exist when you see a film because the film was shot a year ago, is, is marketed and, and produced and edited, and now it's been delivered to the movie theater, and you see, you know, nothing's gonna actually happen to you and you're supposed to know nothing's going to happen to you when you when you are being scared at the theater but you know you still have a an actor who has his own mind and and, and uh, uh, you know feelings and emotions that and how he feels he or she feels that day as well as you know the potential for things to just go sort of haywire it adds his own level so i mean i i think that there the immediacy of it all and, and sort of the human element adds a level of danger that exist nowhere else. Well, it's funny you said danger because sort of the one argument that people always give for why do people like, why do people like scary stuff? Yeah. And one argument is that people want a safe space to express yeah. fear that they have. But I always, I hear another argument which I find equally persuasive which is that this over emphasizes safeness. That people don't actually like to be safe. They, they gravitate towards horror for something a little dangerous. Yeah, well, it's sort of like People who do like a whitewater rafting trip or something, they still want to have like a uh, an experienced guide who knows where to go and take them to like the the, the best ride that they they can. Or a roller coaster is sort of the same thing. You know that's been inspected, um, but uh, but like 
So they, they, they tell themselves that they, they want that element of danger, but at the same time, they, they, they know deep down inside that it's still a controlled environment and it's, and it's, it's got its um, levels of safety. But, but you know, for them to sort of get into it, they, they sort of take my original argument, which is, you never know. Yeah, because and, the, the raft <laughs> might pop up. Right, exactly. You know, it might so blow. Or and, 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 you know, and, and, like and you never know when that rock is going to come It through, really or. could. And you know, and there's animals in the wild. You don't know what the, what's going <laughs> on. Your your boatsman is basically there's lots some of things you grizzled can't control. Off, off Broadway actor. So you want the most controlled environment that still has a level of uh, actual danger to it, but that one something that I think that you think you can handle. So so without giving spoilers, what's going to scare me in the pumpkin pie show? <laughs> well, I'm talking directly to you. Yeah. I mean, I want to I want to make you as much a part of the performance as whoever's performing. Do you the... want to make me uncomfortable and unnerved by your presence? I, I want to make a connection with you. Yeah. I, want, I want there to be a certain level of catharsis, not just for you, the audience member, but for me, the, audi uh, the, the performer. I'm making you and your responses and your, your kind of engagement just as much a part of the show as whatever it is I'm doing under the lights. What about you? Uh, so th this is real, the title is sort of a quadruple entendre. One of the meanings, uh, meanings of it is that when I did the haunted house for, I uh, did a haunted house called Nightmare for 14 years. And one of the things that people would always ask me is like, um, you know, what are you af afraid of? And, you know, it was one of the popular questions and I would, you know, I always had sort of my canned answer, rats. Rats actually really scare me. But um, a lot of people, oh, you, uh, you can't scare me. Nothing can scare me. I know it's all fake. And, and uh, so the, the one thing that you can do is create things that are not fake. Like that are sort of literally happening uh, and that have real stakes. Now, of course, I'm not going to actually uh, brutalize or torture someone um, in, in real time. Or, <laughs> but, uh, but what I can do is create things that are real, which is like separating people, pin, um, pitting people against each other, um, things that, um, that are real to them. How do you pit people against Well, in this them? one, like, so in this one, there, um, what I'm trying to do in a lot of ways is create a real level of anxiety because it's, it's a cat and mouse game. You're basically um, evading your captors. After you sort of escape them, then you have to evade them. And you have to sort of, it's kind of like extreme hide and seek where you have to sort of wait in a space and then where they, like, just like in a horror movie as if you're a character in it, they, they, you know, the bad guys are looking for you and they're, and they're sniffing around and they're looking around. So it's like, and if you get caught, there's actually a real repercussion. You, you get three deaths in my show. And so if, you, if they catch you, you're, you're, you're dead. Now, no, no one's thinking that they're actually going to kill you. But, they, but you do know that, like, if I get three of these things, I'm sort of out of the game. So that's, that's real. Do you think, see, of the, see this as a haunted house, a show, or a game? Being who I am, I like to call it immersive theater because, I mean, there is, you know, it it's actually has a, a, like a 40 page script that goes with it. And, and but it, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure uh -huh. immersive thing. Like, if the audience does this, you say and do this. If the audience does that, you know, ipso facto, you do and that. And are different audience um, members having different things happen to them? Uh, well, yeah. I mean, oh. actually, there are multiple rooms yeah. where, where, like, you're split up. That's the other thing. So we do split you up from your friends. And the idea is that you have to find, get back to them. You have to reunite with them at some point. Now, do you do um, hokey old haunted house things, like having people crawl on grapes to be eyeballs? No, I used to. <laughs> I mean, I never did that. But I, I, did, I did, I used to do, and I did a little trial run of this last uh -huh. year. And I just couldn't get the haunted house out of me. Like some of the hiding spots would have like an air cannon or a, uh, like a water mister or like some sort of loud noise or a strobe light. But I was like, I'm really trying to create an environment that feels as real as possible and in a real, and if you were really um, captured by somebody, they wouldn't have all kinds of booby traps and puzzles and games. So it's actually like, it's, I try to strip it of all of its haunted house elements. So it's a haunted house. People are treating it like a haunted house when they buy the tickets. But, um, but it's, uh, it's very far away from a traditional haunted house. It's, so so how, when we're telling people about it, what are they going to get? Um, well, I mean, it's You're a... You're going to abduct it, first down. of all. Is that right? Come on down to This Is Real. <laughs> well, it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, a simulated abduction. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, you have to... You get abducted, you have to uh, uh, unbind yourself, get out of your cage, um, evade the captors, save the girl, um, kill, the, kill your captors, and get out of the building. I mean, that's basically the long and short of it. That's a lot. It, How it's long a lot, is the yeah. evening? It's, 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 it, I mean, it kind of does depend on them. Oh. 
Uh, but it's been averaging around 70 to 80 minutes. And, and the pumpkin pie show, when if somebody say, come on down, what are you going to get? Um, you're going to get a little campfire on stage. I mean, we're, we're in like a little rinky-dink basement uh, black box theater. And there's the no, best. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's where we've lived where's, for the last 20 years. Where's your rinky-dink black box theater located? We are at under St. Mark's, which oh. is oh, yeah. 94 St. Mark's Place between 1st and Avenue A. Um, it's been our home for like 20 years now. And we, I mean, we have no sets, no props, no costumes. It's basically a, a group of performers uh, spinning these, these kind of yarns. Uh, I've been writing these, these weird stories for, for years now, and I, I think of them as short stories, but they're first person narratives. You get an actor behind it, and it becomes this kind of like shake and bake theater. We're going through a back catalog of like 60 some odd stories that we've done over the last uh, two decades. There are stories that go beyond just like, there are no vampires, there are no werewolves. These are real people who have reached a certain kind of emotional curdling point that, that feels very like, I could be your neighbor, I could be the guy sitting next to you on the subway, but I have, I have lost a certain uh, grip on reality. One thing that is notable about your show is it's often working with some kind of something mundane or everyday, like a, a, a middle school boy talking about sex yeah. or a political campaign, and then it's putting this sort of mundane thing in this flamboyantly uh, frightening horror context. Yeah, I, I don't want to be the, the boogity boo guy. I, I want it to be something that is like profoundly unsettling, that is something you're going to take away out of the theater and you're going to go home and you're going to be in bed and all of a sudden you're going to be like, as soon as you close your eyes, you're just going to say, oh man, that, that, that woman fed her daughter minced up you know, dot, 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 no spoilers. And like, you know, it's, it's, if you can, if you can take something out of the theater as an audience member, then you know you've, you've, you've reached that, that kind of primal fear spot, which is a lot more yeah. poignant than the like. Pop scares are ephemeral, whereas. But, but what do you mean by pop scare? Something jumping out. Jumping out with the very, are you the boogity boo guy? Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, I have a really um, uh, broad, audience yes so some of them force me to be a boogity boog <laughs> guy because they they want it they need it okay. um so uh it was i was more the um the boogity boo guy when i had the haunted house it's like if you didn't have a level of things jumping out at you at least at some point um people would be you know very disappointed they would now they just have to be captured well now it's just really intense like i feel like people are much <clears throat> more scared by what i'm doing now than what i used to be doing but still people you know, they like to count the number of times things. I mean, I, I swear, I, I'd see that in, in like personal reviews. People, I, something jumped out at me 12 times, and they would like base it on their, their enjoyment on how many times something jumped out at them. What's scarier in, in these kinds of shows? Something happening to you, or you seeing something horrible happening? I've always wanted to have more empathetic moments in, in the shows as much as possible. Um, whereas haunted houses don't, that's not a, something you traditionally do. But, um, but it was always super important to me that like not everything was always about uh, something happening to you, that you would see something terrible happening to, to someone else and that would make you, to your point, like feeling more haunted inside. Is if you can get, um, get them on board with the empathy, then like when, they, when things start happening to them personally, then it, I think it's much more So are you powerful. putting in people, are you p putting in actors who are being Tormented yes, in certain yeah. ways, yes. The whole first part of my show is you watching something terrible happen to someone else, yeah. <laughs> oh. mm -hmm. And then the suggestion is that that's about to happen to you, and um, and then you got to keep that from happening to I, you. I would last five minutes. And I went to a show, one of your shows, where an audience member fainted. <laughs> has that happened? To, did you, has that, well, first of all, is that the only time it's happened, or has that happened before? I mean, we've, we've had a, a, a spectrum of experiences or reactions from people saying, not for me, I'm gonna walk out, see you later, not my show, bye, to someone having a, a, an actual panic attack that night that you saw the show. So and, what made the person fade? Uh, we did this show called Seasick, and it was basically about a norovirus uh, taking over a cruise liner. <laughs> very, very kind of ribald, you know, fun and, uh, you know, goofy experience. But there's a lot of, um, talk about what a norovirus does to the body. Ah. And there was this poor gentleman in the audience who uh, w was a bit weak stomached. And this, ah. is, this is just 
talking about. We're just, there is no visual element to it. It is just like we're telling a story. We're spinning a yarn. And this guy had heard enough to feel a little queasy himself. And so he stands up, and this being one of those, those black boxes, your exit is just so happens to be on the other side of the stage. So he has to walk across the stage in front of everybody. And he, he passes out on the stage and it, it was we're we're in the midst of the performance and you know we thought he was maybe a little tipsy had you know needed to find the bathroom but this guy he went down we had to pause the show this. call it just so happened to be the night <laughs> that say, Jason well, well, can we pay you to do this every night <laughs> oh my god there's no greater compliment right that's i mean it was amazing. you could get it was that's, phenomenal. that's like your standing ovation i, I mean it out. was in the press release the very next day <laughs> oh. okay so neuroviruses being captured and tortured and tracked. Yep. All these Halloween wonders are available to you. Uh, thank you so much, Clay McLeod Chapman. Thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much, thank Timothy you. Haskell. Thank, thank you. you so much, Jason. Thank you, Susan. We'll see you next week. Okay, I've got eyeballs for everybody. Yes. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs>